Hey, good morning, everybody. It's Tractor Man 34 here. Hey, you know, when you work with these old tractors, you always got to be ready to, to stop and make a repair or something. I noticed the last couple of times we're using it on the wood splitter. I uh, noticed it's getting a little bit low on water or coolant. Uh, so I'm going to have to pull the front end off here. I think I've got a little crack, a hairline fracture on top of the radiator. I kind of think whenever I put this thing together here a little while ago, I kind of halfway think I remember seeing that. But uh, at any rate, we got to pop this thing apart and take a look-see. I think I see what I'm looking for right here. I think the neck of the fill tube is cracked off right there. As the engine increases in temperature, it gets up above 212 degrees and it starts boiling because it can't produce any pressure with that little seven pound cap on it. So it boils and it evaporates right out of here or boils out the top and it just runs down the front. This thing is cracked. This neck is cracked all the way from here, all the way around the perimeter to about right there. It's not going to be fun. I've got a crack that goes from back here where my finger is from there all the way around the perimeter and right up here to the very front. So about 270 degrees. Well guys, I got the neck on top of the radiator all cleared off. There's still some debris in there. That's going to create a little bit of an issue because whenever we flux and, and start soldering, we'll rely on that flux to, uh, to float out debris that's still impregnated in that old solder that couldn't quite get clear. So once that old solder begins melting, that flux will bubble and carry that nasty stuff right on out of the joint and allow me to replace it with new 50-50 uh, or 95-5. Or but at any rate, during the time I was getting that all ready, I was contemplating the route to go, you know, to make the repair. Uh, no matter what I do, it's not going to be as pretty as what, you know, the factory was. But that's neither here nor there. Our idea is to, to make it function and we get back to work, you know. So what I've decided to do is just go ahead and use the old style copper uh, soldering irons and then use the old blowtorches. Now the other option would be to use a propane fired blowtorch where you actually have the, the slug right on the end of the flame the flame blows out and around and you go ahead and use it inverted and go ahead and use it as a soldering iron while you touch your solder to it or I can go with an electric iron uh, and do exactly the same thing except you don't have to mess with the gas or I can use these old gasoline fired blow torches and I thought now is a perfect opportunity to play with one of these it's been a number of years since I played with them first off you have to put gasoline in the in the torch then you have to heat that gasoline to a point to where it creates a vapor so whenever you open the needle valve right here, the pressure inside the tank will, will blow that atomized mist out and ignite that, uh, ignite that into a flame, into a blowtorch flame. And then the soldering iron itself will rest in the cradle or in the hook and then on the little uh, gun sight notches here and rest right into the, the flame and then heat the torch. And you have to continuously repeat that during the operation because the tip will cool down depending pretty quickly depending on the heat sink capability of the material you want to solder. You can't use a little bitty tiny soldering iron on something that takes heat uh, away really, really rapidly. But at the same time, you don't want to use a big gargantuan, oversized, heavy soldering iron to do a more intricate job because you just can't hardly hold it steady enough to do it. So you have to pick out the right, the right size iron for the particular job. But at any rate, back to the pressure. I showed you this little pump right here. Down inside this cylinder right here, and it's all removable, there's a leather gasket that goes on that pump. It's kind of like a, a weed sprayer. You know, what do you call those, an uh, insecticide sprayer? Whenever you pump them up and pull the trigger, you got pressure in the tank, it blows it out. So that's what you're going to do, is you're going to go ahead and, and pump the pressure up in the tank uh, so that whenever you open it up, you'll uh, blow atomized mist out right here. So this is one variation here, and you can see how it's got a little Y cradle. Here's another variation here. It's missing the cradle, but uh, somebody went ahead and took a piece of heavy wire 
and put that there because the weight of the iron right here is going to fall down in front and lift the handle up and hold it in place. This one here also has a nice heat shield on it right here that will kind of allow you to, to heat up that gasoline as it's coming out of there much more rapidly. It will conserve that heat, but everything else is virtually the same. I think it's even the same manufacturer. might be a little older, I don't know, uh, but it too, you know, it's got the same pump. And then the one that I use almost consistently the few times that I do use them is this old timer right here. I think it's just a little bit of a newer version than these guys here. It's physically just a little smaller, but if you can tell, the pump and the pump gasket in here is still in excellent condition and it goes ahead and builds up the pressure correctly. So we're going to go back to business of using this torch and whatever soldering iron I select or a couple of soldering irons. So uh, that being said, let's look at a couple of, uh, of irons. Now, old Sneelock asked me one time, you know, he said it would be nice to see my complement of uh, blow torches. This is a start on them. This is by no means uh, all of them. Um, I've had guys just <laughs> drop by and give them to me before. Uh, you know, once people find out that you're into old stuff, you know, stuff just kind of comes your way. And I bought a couple of them at a yard sale, you know, for a couple bucks here there. Now you can see them, you know, you can see them now as much as 50 bucks. I've actually seen them more expensive than that. Now that's plum silly, you know, because they are a hundred year old technology and really ain't worth nothing except to somebody like myself that might want to use them. Or as somebody has a, what they call that, uh, decorating. Now if you take a look here, you can see I've uh, went into the soldering iron shelf and pulled out 18 of a variety of sizes and a variety of shapes and with a, uh, a variety of reasons for being. You can see that for very small and delicate, uh, delicate intricate use, you have these little bitty tiny ones right here. Uh, it's not necessarily for soldering circuit boards and stuff, but it's for very small soldering projects when you're in a tin shop. Uh, there's also different, uh, just a variety of the shapes of heads. This one's just like the last one, just a little bit physically larger. Like I said, you have to pick the correct shape of the tip and the weight of the, uh, the copper in order for you to uh, determine which one's best for the project that you're working on. This one here in particular is a homemade one. I'm not sure if the old man made this one or not. I should have wrote, I should have put a mark on it. But somebody took a piece of heavy gauge wire, a big old slug of, of round copper, and they just literally drilled a hole and twisted that through there and jammed it into a, the shard end of a broken axe handle and then that would suffice for whatever it was that that old timer needed to do at that particular time. Now that's that's what you would essentially call a primitive. That thing there is probably pretty doggone old. Here's still a really nice, really nice specimen here. I've used vast majority of these I have used for different things in the past. It's been a number of years though since I have. Here's a whittled out handle. You know, the old timers, you know, they just didn't didn't have the opportunity to just go and buy replacement stuff. Hey, another thing, when you, if you're looking for real old soldering irons, if you take a look here, you'll see how this is a forge weld right here. Okay, whenever you look at the, the type of handle, you can tell the much older ones. This one here is way, uh, way old because it's literally split or it's, it was a round rod that was driven through and then heated and, and banged back around to weld in place. And of course, it's got the old corn cob handle. Uh, that's added. <laughs> Here's another one here that's forge welded and very old. These are all here more than likely well over a hundred years old here. This guy here has seen a little bit of abuse and this one I actually marked my dad's initials on so this is one that came out of his shop years and years ago. I should have marked all of his stuff but I didn't. Uh, some of them I can go by memory. If you look at this guy right here it's another forge weld but that forge weld is all the way up the handle. So it actually disappears into the handle. So that was a long piece of wire that's twice the length of from here to there. And they inserted that on there and then forge welded it after they fitted it to the, uh, to the copper. Now here's a real neat one. This one here is, is old, old. Uh, it's forge weld, but it's never been used. If it has been used, it's been completely worked down and all the tinning and everything is completely go off of it. And uh, it's actually really, really a neat piece. That's for reaching down inside something that needs a good heat sink, but also for reaching way down inside and doing a, something delicate that's very difficult to access. This one here you can tell is not nearly as old. There's just a pin. You can actually see there's a little bit of a flex right here. There's a, a, just a pin driven through the rod. So this here is a fairly new one by fairly new, probably 80 or 90 years old. And here's another one yet, forge welded, very old, probably original handles. 
and you can tell we're getting a little more heft and a little more mass to them. This one here is the one that I've used not too uh, long ago. I had a Massey Harris 44 was, had a leak around the petcock underneath the gas tank, and I used this one here whenever I made that repair. Turned out ugly, but you know what? Don't leak. Here's another one too. You can see the forge weld on it. Forge weld disappears somewhere up in here, so he's got a really good weld joint on that one. And this is an old timer too. And the cool thing about it, once you burn these guys off from excessive use or excessive heat, you can reshape these with a file and then you can re them and start out all over from scratch. Now you can see we're really getting into a little bit more of a heft. This here is going to be for a little bit larger projects. And you can see too, here's a, I think that's just a piece of a hand banister. It's old though and it had actually split and they repaired that with a piece of wire. But hey, you know what? Uh, any port in a storm, you know, whatever works, uh, whatever floats your boat. And here's uh, the big one here. Now this one here you would not want to be handling all day long. I don't have the weight on it. If I put it on a scale, I'm sure that that's going to weigh probably 5 pounds or thereabouts. And of course it's got a 5 8 shaft. That thing is really long. By the time you'd get a handle on it, which it does not have, you know, this thing's going to be about that long. Uh, this would be for pretty large projects. Like I say, that's 18 of what I've got sitting on the shelf. I uh, don't have the time or the reason really to, to lay them all out. But I've got virtually every size and, and tons of configurations of the different tips. So uh, that kind of gives you an idea of what you got to use with the blowtorch whenever you want to make a repair. But I'm going to go ahead about the business of getting the torch fired up, getting it warmed up, getting my soldering irons warmed up. Uh, and then there's still another thing that needs to be covered too. And that's tinning your soldering iron and how to clean that tinning prior to using it with a block of what's called salamoniac. I'll show you that on just a few minutes. So hang in there. I know it's going to be a long one, but uh, you know what? It's fun. What the heck? I never put very much in them. I try to estimate the amount of fuel I'm going to need for a particular job. But if you notice, the bottom of these are all concave. That's kind of create you somewhat of a funnel to make it easier to get the gas in. The easiest way to fill this up, I just put a little gasoline in something that's got an easy pour spout. This may give you a pause if you're faint of heart. You just go in like that. Now the wind is blowing today so it's going to be a little bit of a problem. Because we want that flame to heat up this entire uh, top portion. If you take a look, you'll see how this here now will rest right in there like that whenever we get the blowtorch turned on. And you'll see how it'll heat that copper slug. This right here is a block of sal ammoniac. And yes, you can still buy them, specifically for cleaning and tinning your soldering iron. Now we'll come back once that, uh, once that gets hot enough to start generating. If you notice here, this here is now to pump some pressure into the, into the tank. Now watch the pressure push that stem back up. This particular one here doesn't have the little catch on it to hold that stopper from or the pump from pumping back up. If you turn your torch on too quickly, there won't be enough heat generated to cause that to turn into a uh, that mist that will ignite into a nice blue flame, and it may shoot you six or eight or ten feet of a gasoline flame right out across the. It's getting close. Now, if we were inside the shed where it's a little bit uh, shaded, you can see my blue flame in there. If you look very gently, you can see it right here. But uh, it should be blowing out about so far. My poor old tart's been so long since I used it, uh, it probably needs a little bit of maintenance. I'm leaking a little pressure through here, leaking a little pressure through there. Uh, so it's going to take a little while to get my, uh, my soldering iron heated up. Okay, we're generating enough heat now. Take a little solder and the salamoniac block in my iron. This iron really needs some attention. What I'll do is I'll rub that iron. That salamoniac block will turn black. That's taking the impurities off of my iron and putting that solder on the tip. And I'll be able to turn that tip reasonably shiny. So now, we're going to go ahead and stick it on and see if we can run a little bit of solder. Okay, well I hope you all can appreciate you know, how, how much better we have it nowadays compared to the old days. 
I'm very fortunate to have had the experience of working with these things, you know, to a, to a certain extent, not a tremendous amount by any means, because they were they were definitely on their way out or completely gone by the time I ever got into the industry that I spent my career in. Did I ever master the process? Heck no, I didn't. You're going to find that out in just a second when I show you that nasty thing I got up on top. But you know what? The main thing is it's going to be covered up, number one. Number two, I need to get that machine back on the road and back in use. And if we're a little bit lucky, what we just did, that 270 degree crack around the perimeter of that neck should hold. So I'm going to shut this guy off and I just have a little bit of gas left in it. I can hear it sputtering. It's just about empty. So we estimated about right. Okay guys, I have to edit this in right now. Last night, after I finished this, I was up editing the video and I thought I'd taken care to get some very specific and up close shots of where I was actually soldering on the top of the radiator. And last night I found out that what had happened is I thought I had pushed the start button and apparently did not. Did not notice it wasn't recording because I'm trying to use the hot irons before they cool down. And whenever I came down and turned off the video to reheat my irons, thought I was turning the video off and I didn't. I was actually turning it on because I filmed all the dead air while I was actually waiting for the torch to reheat and then came back and turned it back on which was really turning it off and repeated the entire process. So the whole two several minute videos of the actual soldering process I did not record. I cannot believe it. Those of you that do these videos, these YouTube videos, understand that frustration. I am totally sorry that I missed that because actually I thought it was pretty cool. I stand up on top of the ladder, second rung down from the ladder and a tip of my toe on top of the motor block holding a soldering iron in a real funny fashion uh, because I had to <laughs> in order to get it. So I apologize. If you don't want to watch any more of the video, that's fine. But uh, I thought it better come clear first thing and as soon as I realize it and let y'all know. It is what it is, guys. So at any rate, there you go. I think it's going to be adequate. This side actually looks pretty good. The other side, the other side not so much. But it doesn't matter as long as that crack is sealed up. So I'm going to fill it up with water and uh, fire it up and see what happens. You know, like I told you, it wasn't going to be very pretty. And it really is not very pretty. I think some of the old timers I worked with a long time ago would be a little bit embarrassed to say that they showed, that they showed me anything about soldering uh, because it is a little bit gnarly looking. But uh, the main thing, like I say, is to get this thing back on the road because we use these old tractors. Uh, this isn't a, a show tractor. It never will be. If it is, maybe I'll do something a little bit different. Maybe even buy a new radiator. But you know what? It is what it is, man. And uh, the old tractor is going to be doing fine. Like I said, i got two hours of run time on it. Got it right up to a, a real good temperature. No issues, no problems. So I'm happy as can be. We're putting the uh, sheet metal back on it, and we're heading for the log pile, man. This is Trackman 44, and I am out of here.